Good morning. Thank you for being with us. So I'm delighted to be moderating this conversation with two powerhouses for not only female empowerment, but also leadership. According to UN Women, as of September 2022, gender equality in the highest positions of power will not be met for another 130 years. Only 21% of government ministers globally were women. The statistics are long, but there is clearly an indication that we're not where we need to be. How do we increase political participation of women? is what we want to discuss, but we also want to talk about leadership. And so I want to start with Her Excellency, President um, Kaliulaid. When you um, were president of Estonia, um, in 2021, there was also the prime minister of Estonia who was a uh, female, and you had six female members of cabinet. And this comes as a testament to the leadership of women in your country, but also the progress that happened with political participation. How did you get there and what did you learn from that experience? Well, honest answer is we got there very slowly because Estonian constitution since 1918 already gives women the right to vote. Uh, as you know, many European countries actually arrived there much later. So the progress was by no means quick. Uh, Estonian women have always been uh, well educated because uh, already for several centuries uh, there has been no question whether girls go to the schools or they don't. Also, there are more female graduates in our universities, so it is only natural that finally we also reach uh, the levels of, uh, of, let's say, 30% sometimes more in the government uh, of women. But this doesn't mean, of course, that it is taken naturally by our society. And, uh, and this is where I see uh, female leadership differs, because we all know that, I mean, inside our brains, we don't differ, men and women. Uh, we, uh, we, we have a very similar way of thinking, but our life experience is definitely different, because all women currently, on top in my country, have faced difficulties, hit glass ceilings, uh, conscious, unconscious misogyny, all this has been there for us, and therefore we know also how to tell the society how to avoid this for our daughters and granddaughters. Mm -hmm. And the biggest influence, of course, if you have a female president, a female prime minister, is that small girls never question whether they can become prime ministers and presidents. The strength of role models, hugely important, but that also leads to the strength of perceptions. And Your Excellency, uh, Ms. Munan Murray, I want to ask you about this point of perceptions. Here in the Arab world, even though we just heard from the first uh, Arab Prime Minister and we see women in different positions of power, there's still a general global perception and perhaps reality in certain uh, parts of society where women are not where they need to be in the Arab world. Is this perception accurate and what can we do to tackle it? Thank you, Mina, and good morning, everyone. Um, I mean, the negative perception of the Arab world is unfortunate, but I am sure and confident that this will change because of the efforts that we see today in terms of promoting gender, uh, gender equality and empowering more, more women. We see um, a huge difference and an impact, not only uh, in government, but also in the private sector. Mm. Um, I have one question to ask everyone in this room. I mean, do we really need to focus on changing perceptions? I mean, is this our job to do? Do we need to uh, focus our energy in, in changing perception? I think no. We should really focus our energy on making change and, uh, and helping to change uh, our systems, our uh, legal reforms, our policies, our engagement with the international uh, organizations. I mean, we've been doing really a great job and we should not forget the efforts that has been made here uh, in the UAE on that level. Engagement with the international organizations, uh, the global rankers, uh, ranking that the UAE has achieved on, uh, on, a, on a global level. Um, I mean, for me personally, I think if we keep thinking about perceptions, if we keep thinking how to, ch to change those perceptions, it will even, uh, we will waste our time. Mm. 
we will not focus on building and progressing in this important file. And um, we know that the road ahead of us is still um, challenging. We know that there are things, uh, a lot of things to do, but I think whatever has been done, at least here in the UAE, reflects the positivity that, um, of, of uh, the, the reputation that we want to seek. And uh, I'm sure that uh, a change in perception will follow. Do you think that, ch that change in perception is also needed among society, or is it more an external uh, change? And again, for the Arab world, in addition, of course, to the UAE. I think uh, those who promote uh, such negative perceptions, they will continue doing so. I mean, it's not in our hands to change people's perceptions uh, if they believe in it, no matter what you do, no matter how, uh, how advanced you are, how much you put an effort to change those perceptions. I think what we need to focus on, as I, I've, I've mentioned, that we need to focus on changing our internal systems, changing the legal reforms, policies, introducing new policies. I mean, since the inception of the UAE Gender Balance Council in 2015, a lot of uh, initiatives has been made. A lot of uh, legal ref reforms have been made. We have more than 22 uh, policies and laws uh, that were introduced. Uh, among them is the equal pay as, uh, um, policy, as the women and board policy, um, the 50% representation of women in the parliament. All of these are, are actually um, things you wouldn't, say, you wouldn't see even on an international level. Mm -hmm. So we should keep going on changing those uh, policies and introducing new legislation uh, reforms. President Kalulay, you also mentioned the Constitution. Her Excellency Ms. Murray spoke about the importance of legislation. So part of it is putting in the framework to ensure you've got uh, women's participation. But then there's also the cultural glass ceilings and this idea of women feeling that they can take that role, but also do they need to be given the opportunity or seize the opportunity? Well, indeed, if I listen uh, to, uh, to uh, your presentation, I sense very much uh, how I felt also 30 years ago. Uh, when I was a young woman starting my career, I also chose to ignore these perceptions and just to, I mean, do my thing and do it better than many men to be advancing in my career. But now when I'm in the roles of responsibility, I feel that my role is to speak up, actually, about uh, these perceptions and against these perceptions. Because as I said, many of them are even unconscious. They're not conscious. People have never simply thought about it that, I mean, it's, it's not nice to comment on, uh, on women taking floor in parliament on how they're dressed while they never do this about men. Right. And, uh, and no Nordic country actually can say they are not guilty of treating women and men in politics differently. A man in parliament with a baby in arms is a nice cute father taking responsibility. A woman in the parliament with a baby in hands is a woman who cannot handle her home and work-life balance. And these kind of uh, uh, small, you may say, but still perceptions, they tend to persist unless you point it out. Mm -hmm. And you see this not only at national level, you see it in international organizations where women leaders entering rooms, particularly if they are relatively young, have to much more often to tell, I mean, that they are indeed belong to this group of people. And I've seen it uh, happen to my female colleagues. And we've spoken about it in UN High Level Women's Week. And once um, a woman from uh, one high-level UN body came to me and said, this is really good that presidents and prime ministers talk about how they have hit the glass ceilings. You know why? Because every time she exits a plane, she sees people who have come to meet her to seek behind her who is the important person. And despite the fact that you know it is kind of societal perception, it starts eating away at your self-confidence, <clears throat> and we cannot afford that to happen. And that's why we need repeated, I mean, kind of assurance to women, this is not about you. But of course, there is everywhere a pressure on first generation of women reaching these jobs to perform better than men, because otherwise, if they perform average, they will be told, okay, it was because she was a woman. So that is an added responsibility for first women. I mean, speaking of added responsibilities, there's always um, 
a mixed reaction among some women. They say, I got this job not because I'm a woman, because I'm the best person who could do it. But at the same time, there's the pressure to but speak up as a woman because then you can address these things. Where do you land on that spectrum? I am on that spectrum there that I don't accept congratulations on being a woman in that role. But I do admit that Estonian children in kindergarten, when they draw a president, they draw a woman in a dress. <laughs> and this has a certain influence on society. Um, Ms. Elmer, I want to ask you about looking to the future. So how do you see the role of women in uh, leadership positions evolving in the future? Because as you said, there's very important steps that have been taken. And so how do you see that going forward? Uh, Mina, I'm very optimistic about the future. And uh, I mean, regardless of what I hear so many, regardless of your statistics, I'm still very optimistic of the future. And I believe that uh, um, there are so many um, awareness today. And, uh, you know, the, um, there is a recognition of uh, the importance of diversity, the importance of empowering women uh, across um, government and private. Uh, I see the word is acknowledging uh, the importance also of uh, what can women achieve um, in leadership positions um, and what this brings um, uh, to, 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 the, to the actually to the position itself and to the government in, in terms of innovation, in terms of diversity, in terms of um, even improved, uh, improved uh, uh, policies. Uh, and decisions, and at the same time, the other benefits that uh, women bring to the workplace. Uh, and for me, also, I think, as uh, governments and organizations uh, see the importance of diversity, uh, women also will have the benefit of growing in their careers and advance in their careers. I think one, one important element I want to add here is technology. Mm. And I've, I, I've been hearing it, we all know that, if we take an example, uh, the UAE and six, the 61% of women in STEMs, this means that the future of technology is not male-dominated. It will be, uh, it will, women will have a role in the future. Listening to yesterday's opening remarks on the, the, the future of technology and how it will change the whole world, not only a specific sector, I think women will have a role in that. So I'm very optimistic, optimistic about it, and I know that women will have a greater role in the future. Um. Are you optimistic about the future? Do you see women uh, moving in that uh, positive trajectory? And I wanted to ask, in addition to that, do you believe in quotas? This is also often a topic of conversation uh, when we speak about uh, diversity, but particularly ensuring that women uh, have their space at the table. Well, uh, I like the French way of doing quotas. Uh, they do uh, apply them slightly differently. They say, uh, if you have not met the quota for women in high jobs in ministry or in party lists, then actually you, your support by the government or your, uh, your budget will be discounted slightly, which means that you will pay yourself for the burden which you put on society for not listening to women, because 50% of good ideas by definition have to be born in the women's heads. Mm -hmm. So I like it this way. I don't, <laughs> uh, and for the future, I am optimistic, but I have also to be cautious with optimism, because if I look at the statistics globally, then during the COVID pandemic and the, and the latest years, the position of women in the best societies where you normally associate, I mean, the, the role of women with high jobs like Nordics, to the African countries, the position of women through the pandemics actually worsened. So first we yeah. have to claw back and then we can actually start uh, progressing. But my optimism is based on the fact that I see more and more young men in my own society ready to take this supportive role, which is needed because if a, if a woman is all the time at work, then somebody has to take care of the children. And I'm proud to announce to every journalist who asks me, and this is always a snide question, who makes pancakes to your children on Sunday morning? I'm proud to say my husband does. And there are, <laughs> and there are more men like that now. 
I think the issue of caregiving, be it for children or uh, elderly parents, relatives, as society ages, we also have to think of caregiving on both sides. That really, we saw, particularly during the pandemic, the burden was often on women. Um, but having said that, I think that society and also technology, to your point, uh, Your Excellency, Ms. El Marie, the point of technology allowing hybrid working, more flexible working, and the UAE is also really advancing on that, that allows women, I think, much more ability to work when there's flexibility. Ability. I wanted to ask you about leadership styles. Um, so, um, Ms. El Marie, how would you see the ideal leadership style, particularly for uh, women in leadership positions? Well, uh, the definition of leadership style is very like general to me. But, um, I mean, if you Google, if you just search leadership style, you receive millions of uh, results, whether it's videos, inspirational talks, books, you know, so many outcomes. As, as, as a leader today, I think what we lack in the Arab world is role models. And role models represented, representing uh, a leadership style. And personally, inspiring leadership is summarized in one name. Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, the Vice President and the Prime Minister of the UAE, and the ruler of Dubai. I mean, it's maybe uh, technically I've been working for the past 21 years, but with him closely, maybe for the past 15, 16 years. And I've seen, I've observing him and his leadership style with, um, with its uh, human-centric, Mm. and uh, result-oriented uh, approach is inspiring, not only to us here in the UAE, but also on a regional level and globally to many leaders. Um, His Highness, I mean, what, I mean, what I see in him, um, he achieved one thing. Actually, he shared his vision with his people. He, he, he empowers people. His passion and teamwork, that's something I admire in him. So when you find a personality, a role model that inspires you, you follow this school of leadership. And I, I'm proud to follow, uh, and I hope that I'm following the same school of leadership of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed, and as so many of us here do. So. I think leadership is all about role models. Find your role model and just try to, you know, see the best out of this role model and implement, learn, because learning is never, should not uh, stop at all. President Kelly Lade, who's? Thank you. Well, I was jealous. She's been getting the whole, you know. <laughs> Well, laughing, and I was, I need, I need some. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, President Kalilade, who's your role model? Well, um, my neighboring countries, Finland, with Tarja Holonen, Latvia, with Aira Vike Freiberga, Lithuania, with Talia Gribauskaite, Iceland was already mentioned. I mean, my, my, my neighbors, my friends, uh, other presidents in the region, with whom we always assure that uh, our leadership style is, is fact-based, science and data-based. And this is very important for us female leaders because, of course, we have to prove all the, every day that our decisions are not emotional. Mm. And this is something which makes us probably to dig more into data than, uh, than maybe sometimes some other. So this is uh, my management style. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Thank you for sharing your insights with us uh, and teaching us really about not only leadership styles, but how you look towards uh, role models and uh, changing for the better the future. Thank you both. Please thank, thank my panel. You. Thank you.